My deep appreciation of theater history was instilled in me by Tom Empey, a college mentor to me and hundreds of others. While teaching Greek theater terms, he would grab the fabric of his slacks and say, You see these pants? Euripides, Eumenides making light of content that could be considered rather dry and stuffy while still maintaining respect for the art, which is what I want to do with this podcast. For each episode, I invite a guest from the many paths my theater career has taken me down. I give my guest no idea what we'll be talking about, but they know we're going to find an outrageous story about theater history and perhaps get a better understanding about why we're still doing it after all these years. So welcome to Euripides Humanities, and I am your host, Aaron Odom. Apocalypse, I said, why you want to show up now? Just when the heart of my life was getting good. I'll give you one more train. Walk on out of the door, yeah. Get your ass to getting where the getting is good. Good morrow, Humanitites. This is Aaron Odom from Trident Theater, bringing you another episode of Euripides Humanities, a theater history podcast. The countdown continues. <laughs> I'm down to just a few topics for episode 100, and that should be dropping sometime in November. I've thought long and hard about it, but there's still time to submit your suggestion. Send me a message via DM to the Instagram feeds for either Trident Theater or Euripides Humanities. You can also use the contact us form at tridenttheater.com, or just send me an email to trident at tridenttheater.com. I'd love to hear from you in any case. Now, I'm finding that I'm having one of those great problems that most theater artists would love to have. I'm overbooking myself. <laughs> At this point, I'm still the president of a community theater board, and our new season is starting this week. And as though that wasn't enough, I, it's my birthday on the date that this drops, September 18th. On top of that, I've booked myself for back-to-back -back directing projects that will keep me busy through this fall and winter. So... <laughs> In preparation for this week's episode, I reached out to my good friend Laurel Rockle, one half of the hosts of the wonderful history podcast, High Tales of History. Laurel and her sister Katie Wall have a great format for their show, which is very similar to Euripides Humanities. They both prepare a story from history to tell each other without telling each other what the topic is. But there is one caveat. At the beginning of the episode, they admit what substance they are using to get high by the end of the episode. <laughs> Most often, it's some cannabis-based product, but sometimes it's just a good old stiff mixed drink. Laurel and Katie have been on my show several times, and I've been on theirs as well. So what you'll be hearing in this episode is the material I prepared for them on their episode 68. I would strongly urge you to go find the, ep the rest of that episode, or just anything in their catalog. They've got so much beautiful and hilarious history on that show. And for that episode 68, Laurel and Katie prepared for me the centuries-long history of the Jester. But I prepared for them just another one of those little nuggets of hilarious theater history that turns out it's so much more complex than the end result. <laughs> You'll see what I mean when we get there. So without further ado, I give you this episode, The Kaiser Cracks Wise. Well, we're thrilled having you back first and foremost, and oh, I love, we I love such being a great here. time love with it. you. I was yeah. on your show a couple of times. Katie got yeah. to go on there. It's always a blast whenever we get to hang out with you. And so, yeah, yeah. I want to ask Katie, how are you doing with uh, what we revealed about Peter Pan when you were on the show? I mean, you know, I haven't, <laughs> well, let's see how long ago that, I mean, I haven't watched it since. Uh -huh. uh, see, I, I win. <laughs> I ruined it for you. <laughs> but I do still sing the songs. Yeah, well, yeah. not all of them. But yeah, yeah. Like yeah. second start of the right, and then what's the big one? Um, you can, you can fly. fly. I yeah. I sing that all the time. Oh man! And then I try yeah. and zoom the cat around the house, and she very quickly declines the offer. <laughs> uh, I'd rather not. 
Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to check in with that. I often, uh, you know, I'll tell I'll tell people about things on my show because, uh, you know, you don't have to be a, a theater history fan to be a fan of the show. You just have to enjoy like weird history stories like you do on this show. And it just mm-hmm. happens that all of mine revolve around history stuff or theater stuff. So, you know, uh, I mean, the origin of Peter Pan, you can go back and look up that episode and, and wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, but, yeah, we uh, found out that that was first a play and that there were some really... <laughs> I will say questionable, questionable origins. Is a good word for it. <laughs> questionable mm-hmm. origins behind, uh, you know, the development of the character, and you know, a lot of, a uh, lot of uh, what today we might determine as a grooming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, that would be which didn't lead anywhere. Which was also like, then why are you doing it? <laughs> expect this to be lurid at some at some point in this day and age so (laughs) (laughs) and also the last time you were on here episode 41 which everybody go check that one out it was oh yeah just blah yeah such a blast that's a good that's a good like episodic one you know bring it back like Mm -hmm. a few different times do two or three different workouts a couple different commutes because it was a long one but every out yeah every morsel of it was just outstanding so good. We mm-hmm. talked about entertainment and ancient Rome. Well, Aaron did. Yes. And then Katie and I talked about wrestling as wrestling. theater and sports and Ugh. how that gets used. And man, you know what's funny is I'm actually an avid nostalgia. wrestling fan now. Like after that, <laughs> I, I, I choose to sit and watch it with him. Not only do we watch Raw, we watch SmackDown and NXT. What is everyone drinking tonight? <laughs> hey, isn't mm. that a question? Uh, let's start guests first. Oh, well, I am enjoying my, uh, you know, uh, I believe the kids today call it a vodka and Red Bull, but um, oh. I am enjoying my a- very, my Gen X version of that, which is a Mountain Dew Zero Sugar and red, and, and vodka. Uh, yes, amazing. I am proudly Gen Xer, and I was sitting here thinking about how am I going to describe this drink tonight, and I'm thinking, you know, here we are in a history podcast, and someday we're going to be the people that will tell the days of old. And I'll be right. able to say, yes, kids, I was I was born in the final days of the Carter administration. <laughs> you know, not not the not the gas shortage days when cars were lined down the street. No, no, no. Those days were long past. It was the days when he was horn swoggled by an actor. An actor <laughs> without a brain. And of course at the time we didn't know he didn't have a brain, but uh, he was part of the moral majority because we thought we didn't have any morals anymore. <laughs> no, they were simpler times. There we go. Not to mention <laughs> that you lived through the pandemic too. Oh god. Wait Ooh. wait till that hits the history books. People will be like, What well, the fuck? And you'd be like, Don't ask. We just mm. we don't talk oh. about it. So, so check this out. Like I, we went to New York. I took my boys and I took uh, the woman who walks beside me, Andrea, to New York, and we saw a Broadway show. We saw um, that was the oh, most was majestic it? title ever. Mm-hmm. I love the way you, you talk about her. It's so oh, lovely. I love. I, yeah. yeah, that was what we decided a long time ago. We were like, "What are we? Boyfriend, girlfriend?" We're like, "No, we're kind of like past that age." So, what are we? Man, friend, lady, friend? That's really weird. And she came up with it, and I'm like, "That's like a Johnny Wait, Cash yeah. lyric, isn't it?" I don't care. Right. That's hmm. that's it. That's what we do. So she's the woman who walks way beside superior me, to what her. I call Blake. Mm-hmm. I call him a long term booty call with mortgage benefits. So what are you also do? accurate? Also <laughs> accurate. But anyway, we went to New York and Andrew really wanted to go see the 9-11 memorial. And my kids were like, yeah, I don't really want to do that. And we're like, why not? It's part of history. They're like, well, you mm-hmm. know, it, this is a really positive trip. We had a lot of fun this week and I don't want to mm-hmm. button it with a downer. So, mm-hmm. but she, she eventually went and, and, but at the same time, I was like, why don't you want to see that? It is. Yeah. And, and even Andrew's kids who are. Uh, 24 and 22, they were like, yeah, why do you want to go see that? And, you know, and we go, why what? don't you want to see that? They're like, we don't yeah. remember it. Mm-hmm. It wasn't in our lifetime. Oh. Some of them. And I went, yeah. yeah, but it affected you. You realize that. Well, in what way? And I'm like, okay, let me point this out. 
Hey, heard of standardized testing in schools? We wouldn't have that without No Child Left Behind. You know why we had No Child Left Behind? Because George W. Bush got elected to a second term. You know why George Mm -hmm. W. Bush got elected to a second term? Because he was a wartime president. You know why he was Mm -hmm. a wartime president? Because he was a lame duck president when a massive, you know, invasion took place in our country. Domestic terrorism hit, yeah. So... So, uh, yep. yeah, all of that affected you in your daily life where you have to go mm-hmm. Ugh, three days out of the year. I got to sit in the auditorium and <laughs> do a class. Yeah. Like, as well as well, their travel so I must to be the, the city, last, you know? I must be the last right. generation to remember that. Like the last of, because I do remember it. it. It's early, but I remember it. Yeah. Andrew went and she was really glad she did, but it wasn't like, yeah. hey, what a cool museum. Mm-hmm. You know, it is a cool no. museum, but at the end of it, you're just like, Ugh. like how you yeah. feel after you got about out of Oppenheimer. You're like, Ugh. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. Oh, well, I'll tell you, you'll go and you'll I go, just Ugh. never go to the movies. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Well, I like when you stream it at home, you'll go. Ugh. Yeah. Okay. Right. Did mm-hmm. I get enough so of that? Downer, sound bite? Huh? Okay. <laughs> Is it a well, real counter? It's about, huh, are we as humanity actually going to destroy the world? Maybe. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Roll credits. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're not wrong. That's, Maybe that's we will. Exactly. Yeah. And then later we'll go, what happened? And we'll have I understand. Like these to remind us what happened. I hope so. I okay, so that's, a, the that's uh, the quick. That's the quick story of what I'm drinking. Uh, what are you drinking? <laughs> oh, I'm going to go next. Okay, well, I, I thank you for for leading this little segment of the show. I'm going to turn my little sweaty cup around. <laughs> oh, you still you still have those. So my husband was invited to. Um, so he's he's in youth sports and soccer and whatnot soccer and... not just any sport please <laughs> but he was invited out by a big uh sportswear brand to go to la for the arsenal barcelona exhibition game and he came back with like what felt Lucky like bastard. 37 of these things because because <laughs> as everyone was leaving a lot of them left behind the souvenir cup that you pay an extra a couple of bucks so for he keeps your beers them. so he's, he's just going, frap, them on the way frap, out frap. What? yep why so why well, would you do that? <laughs> so we can have super icy cold drinks at home that uh, no, but I guess... like other people had them. Just take what you got and leave. Uh, okay, oh, I know. No, oh, I know. I'm gonna jump in. I'm gonna jump in on this because we just went to Broadway, <laughs> and this was a thing when I first went about four years ago that I didn't realize was a thing. When you go to a show, if you go okay. to a Broadway show, go get yourself a yeah. drink, get yourself a right. soda, get yourself a, 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 an alcoholic beverage, whatever. They have souvenir cups for every oh, single right. show you go to with the show logo on them. Oh, wow. Which is why now we have four Lion King cups upstairs and seven Sweeney Todd cups upstairs. And those are mm-hmm. our drinkware right now. Oh, I'm uh, drinking gin and tonic, by the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm drinking can, my favorite flavor, the lemon lavender. Ooh. There it is. Oh, my God. C A N N. Her Boom. usual little beverage. Stuff. Love it. I do. So, uh, what do you say, kids? Should we history? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Actually puts Aaron in the hot seat first. Shit. I mean, <laughs> so. Okay. Well, I, I heard of this story a long time ago, and I couldn't figure out how to make it a full episode of my show. So I'm like, if I am invited somewhere, people will get a taste of what I do on my show, talking about an interesting story from history that happens to revolve around theater, but would probably fit in more towards a like general history podcast and something people can pour over. So this one, this one's very interesting. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anybody has ever seen the movie I Heart Huckabee's. Uh, with David, uh, David O. Russell movie with like Mark Wahlberg, Naomi Watts, Jason Schwartzman. Uh, for the record, I hate that goddamn movie. Um, but I have never, it's one of the few times in my life where I've, I haven't laughed harder at the end of a movie 
than I did at that one. Because it is okay. this big buildup about philosophy and the meaning of life and trying to explore that through a lens of history with all these freaking malcontent wimps. And uh, at the at the end of it, there's one thing where they're doing therapy with those punch balloons. You know, it's like on a rubber band and you punch the balloon. Yeah. And, and, uh -huh. and apparently it's supposed to be therapeutic uh, in some version of this story. <laughs> but uh, at at the end of the story, these two people realize that they haven't actually come to any concrete solutions to their problems. They haven't, like, discovered the meaning of life after sitting and thinking about it for, you know, a couple of days. And at the end of it, one of them just has a, a punch balloon in his hand and hits the other guy in the head. And the guy's <laughs> stunned for a second. And then he hits him in the head again. And the guy falls over. And you sit there for a second, and then the credits roll. And I am dying laughing. I'm like, you went through philosophy for two hours making us go through this entire thing. And the meaning of it all is hit a guy over the head so he falls over and we laugh at it. I was rolling. I was by myself in a small apartment cackling on the floor. This story That's is probably going to be very similar. <laughs> That's funny. So to start my story, I will ask you this. How <laughs> familiar are you with the families of the heads of state of World War I? Mm, decently. Are you really? Like, well, you're talking about the Austrian prince and all that, like. Well, kind of. Kind of. I'm talking about when the conflict was started. Who was in control of the factions from each country? I remember specifically actually having to like write an essay about it and it sucked. Ooh, so yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not that I yeah. don't love history. It was just a lot of, listen, oh. have you ever read the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's the thing about the Bible. This fucking guy had a kid and he had a kid who had a kid and then he had a kid who had a kid. And then, Oh, oh. by the way, this is this guy's cousin and this and this oh. and this. And I was like, okay, whoa. Listen, okay. I need you to slow down. This is boring. It's not interesting. <laughs> and nobody's died yet. Here's what I'm going to do. This, this, will, this will basically be my book report on uh, okay. the, uh, the interwoven branches of the heads of state. Uh, I mean, I want to take a look at the royal families involved with World War I. And I'm going to mm -hmm. do my best to untangle the family trees so we can understand this story. Because those trees grew very near each other. And got very tangled up. Okay. Yeah, sure did. So, to set the scene, I'll remind you of a few global powers on each side of the conflict. Germany fought for one coalition, while Great Britain and Russia were allied in the other coalition. The leaders of these countries are the main players in today's story. Kaiser Wilhelm II. Kaiser. Going to yeah. send you. No, I'm not going to send you that picture yet. No, I want to send you that picture. So you okay. uh, you know what I'm Wilhelm. talking about. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I love gosh. that name, though. Wilhelm. Oh, it, it is glorious. There's Kaiser Wilhelm II. Oh. Mm. Look at that stash. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I like his I mean, skull and crossbow. Is that a skull? Mm -hmm. Isn't that ridiculous? Okay. So for... Dude, that's for, so metal. Yes. For, for just listeners who aren't watching the video, yes, um, we've got uh, the Kaiser who's got this fantastic mustache that is mm -hmm. pointed upwards for a few inches on the ends, which was fantastically waxed, and he made sure it was every day. And then on his head is like this Cossack, uh, you know, yeah. big poofy hat that yeah, has been like... Russian style. Yeah, that has been like Mad Maxed to a degree with like a little skull and like it looks like a laser eye on the top and this some is such an accurate metal brackets, right? Okay. So that's Kaiser oh, Wilhelm. Man. Okay. So for generations leading up to world war one, it had been something of a family tradition for the members of the Royal families of Russia to create bonds and marriage with the German houses of nobility. Hmm. Like they only fished in that pond. Okay. Hmm. In fact, it was known that some Russian czars expected and almost demanded that their sons marry women of class from some of the great houses of Germany. Like, don't look elsewhere. <laughs> not, not even in our own country. <laughs> okay. From what I understand, wow. 
This preference derived from the czar's belief that German women of nobility were much more refined and cultured than women from any other country, mm. including Russia. <laughs> oh, I figured they just want a sturdy German gal like Greta. Right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You mm-hmm. have good bones. Uh, and not only that, German women were often considered more attractive than women from other countries as well. I mean, I'd say at so. least, at least by the Germans. <laughs> Apparently, they had a they had a fetish. Uh, that would be their OnlyFans page. German women, please. <laughs> okay. Okay. On the flip side of that coin, to keep up public appearances, the czars believed it also helped create stronger alliances with the German government, and everyone needed mm-hmm. their allies. So they're saying, "Look, we have very strong relations with the Germans, and they're sexy, sexy, well cultured mm-hmm. women." <laughs> <laughs> You should see their hips. You should see their hips, especially when they stand behind leaders of state when they are giving... I'm doing a German accent for Russians. It's terrible. (laughs) Okay. So, this preference became fairly awkward during the outbreak of World War I when the two countries found themselves on opposite sides of the conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. a tough one. That'll be weird. It's like, no, we... Wait, uh, let's get into Russian. No, we don't like the German women anymore. We did, but then there was war, and now we don't like them. So we say, but we still keep them in our beds. I was going to say, it could be <laughs> more exciting for them, really, if you think about I it. Could, well, maybe ooh. don't think too hard. <laughs> yeah, we, we are sleeping with enemy. What do you make of this? Anyway. <laughs> but it might not have been the best timing for Russia to have entered a war in 1914. As we may recall, civil unrest had been growing in Russia for quite some time, and the Russian citizens were just about to have enough of the Russian royal family, the Romanovs. (laughs) Laurel is mm, sucking air through her teeth here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. One of the many reasons... One of the many reasons that the Russian people had reason to be despondent with the Romanovs is that during a time of war, one of the Romanovs was a German princess. This was Alexandra. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, uh, <laughs> Russian, <laughs> uh, and, you know, for Russian people to already be at, at unrest, but still kind of patriotic, you know, I mean, it's my understanding that Russia is a very matriarchal country. So mother Russia. So for one of their royal women to be a German, kind of a slap in the face to know that she was in the royal family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they're like, okay, so we're going Ooh. to war with these people, but apparently one of them's here. Great. Okay. I'm sure she's not slipping notes when, when relatives drop in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this anti-German sentiment became so great that the imperial government felt compelled to rename the city of St. Petersburg in 1915, removing the root word Berg from the city's name. It was renamed Petrograd which in uh, Russian means a city of Peter after Peter the Great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Laurel is just gobsmacked. I actually did not know that's why. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That's like, great. Oh, no. Well, they don't seem to like the German thing. Let's get rid of the Berg. Who's famous? Peter. It's, it's fine. It is city of Peter. <laughs> okay. Now, it sounds like drastic action needed to be taken to attempt to keep the country together. The country had already gone through one revolution in 1905 and the Imperial government managed to get out of that one, but the feelings of the constituency were still pretty hurt. It was a bold move, but still ultimately didn't work in 1917. The Russian government was overthrown by Bolsheviks and the Royal family was imprisoned and summarily either executed or exiled. And they were executed by firing squad. I think it was in the courtyard of their own home. If I recall, yeah, or some in the basement, like and some yeah. of oh, them yeah, happened yeah. out yeah. in the uh, basement. Yeah, and then some of them actually, I thought they actually happened out in the forest. Alexei and uh, oh, yeah. Anastasia. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't sure. pleasant either way. Yeah. it no. wasn't pleasant. Also, <laughs> yeah. So, still at war, the Russian people only strengthened their hatred for Germany. This was no secret to Kaiser Wilhelm II, the current emperor of Germany, and it really bothered him just how much the Russians hated Germany. 
What? You're a head of state. <laughs> 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 you're going, I don't understand. Why do the Russians hate us? It's not, it's not fair. Especially so, in wartime. Yeah. Wartime. Mm. It's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, can't they just get over it? God. Yeah, I'm not too sure how bad I feel for old Wilhelm at this point, but it's kind of part of the job. If you're going to be the head of state, not everyone is going to like you, especially the constituencies of enemy nations. In any case, I hope you're enjoying this so far, and I hope you go check out High Tales of History when you're done with this episode. Whatever you have an itch for history-wise, I have a feeling Laurel and Katie can scratch it. And feel free to check out Euripides Humanities and Trident Theater on Instagram, too. Pretty good stuff there. But let's get back to Laurel Rockle and Katie Wall of High Tales of History for the rest of this episode, The Kaiser Cracks Wise. <laughs> Putting politics aside, though, it sounds like Wilhelm and his wife really liked Alexandra and several of the other German princesses that had been wed into noble families in Russia. Not to mention that the Kaiser and Tsar Nicholas II were distant, re distantly related themselves through various couplings mm. between German and Russian royal families. It was distant, okay. but they were, they were bound by some blood at some point. Yeah. So... For the Russian people to be hating on the Russian royal family so much, part of which was hating on the Germans, that they executed them, well, that was just insult to injury for poor Kaiser Wilhelm. <laughs> They're really trying to get under my skin by killing all these people. He's having a lot of emotions oh, no. about this. He's having a lot of feelings. Oh, they did that. Why? It's, I'm very hurt. As though that weren't enough, he took even more offense to the fact that countries were allying against his forces, and he took offense to this for a few reasons. Number one, Wilhelm considered himself to be a very chivalrous man, and war was definitely a duty reserved for those who have earned titles. Okay? Mm. After all... Oh. He did have three big official titles as the ruler of Germany at the time. German emperor, as I said, mm -hmm. the king of Prussia, which was like the yes. northern part of Germany. Yep. And this is my, mm -hmm. my favorite one. I, I don't know where they stamped this, but it, it, it's official. Supreme War Lord. Oh. <laughs> well. That's a Star Wars title, isn't it? Like <laughs> and it, Right? <laughs> Seem to be a so, trend with the leaders in Germany at this time. They really seem to have an overinflated sense of self. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you could say. I mean, the the term the the one of the terms the president of the United States has is commander in chief. You're like, oh, I get that. He's the top. Okay, right. Supreme warlord. I mean, is there a yeah. degree below that? You know, like you know, sub. <laughs> I mean, uh, or above I'm making that? fun Sublime of them. warlord. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. Okay. Good. You know, I'm making fun of them, but here's the deal. If I was in that position, I would 100% give myself a title like that. <laughs> I know who I am. You know I who would, I am. I would, would tattoo I it on my head. Yes, I would I be walk like, into yes. a room and they go, what's that say? Oh, 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 he's supreme. Okay. I guess we bow. Do we bow? <laughs> Do I, I, kneel. Kneel always works. Kneel. Okay. okay. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, here's, yeah. here's the second part of why uh, Wilhelm didn't like this allying against him. Is a quote I found about his character. Kaiser Wilhelm II, imperious, impulsive, imbued with notions of the divine right of kings in Germany's God-given trajectory to greatness, while at the same time insecure and hypersensitive to slights to his imperial dignity or his dynastic mission, was arguably the very last person who should have been entrusted with the immense powers of the Hohenzollern military monarchy at such a critical juncture in Germany and Europe's history. Ooh. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who wrote, I no, I know who wrote that, but boy, they had a, they had an opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not a wrong one either. No, no. It sounded like, I mean, yeah, 
Yeah. I mean, t- I, given what we already know, he's hypersensitive about how people feel about him. Well, mm-hmm. what that actually means is that an entire government is being reestablished. Millions of people are dying and he's just getting all butthurt in, in Berlin and going, but why are they being so mean? <laughs> yeah. I think about that mm-hmm. when people talk about Lincoln's mental state during the Civil War and how mm-hmm. he was like very frequently depressed. And you're like, who wouldn't be? Yeah. <laughs> Half the country <laughs> left the country when he got elected. Right. right. <laughs> He's like, yeah. Oh, what is it? Like he me? carried. <laughs> he, is it me? He carried the opinion. like the weight of the union, man. Like, what the hell? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's that's a more extreme example. What mm-hmm. you're talking about here was a very tense military conflict that was kicked off by what even today, like I read about the assassination of uh, an Ecuadorian presidential candidate this week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the world isn't falling apart, but it did in, in 1914. And Mm -hmm. they just happened to like split off and be like, well, if somebody kills this leader from Austria, Hungary, we will join the army uh, or we will join the fight. And then Britain's over there going, no, we will join the other side. And Russia's over there going, we will join the Americans and the British. I'm just, showing off at this point so i i'm really um, impressed actually yeah i'm just i was like oh good job. <laughs> sorry christian <laughs> you anyway. can do voices babe what can i tell you i don't know <laughs> bags are packed no i'm kidding you, you'll be turned away andrew will be right here going i'm sorry he's taken um, um. now <laughs> The execution of the Romanovs took place in 1918, but the revolution had begun in March 1917. And as I mentioned earlier, the Kaiser was well aware of the anti-German sentiment coming from Russia. But I have to take a break for station identification and add one more nugget that makes all these international politics so interesting. Here's how all of this ties together with the family trees of Germany, Russia, and Great Britain. Oh, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany and King George V of England were first cousins. Mm -hmm. There it is. As the Kaiser's (laughs) mother was Princess Victoria of England, who was married to Kaiser Wilhelm's father, Frederick III. Princess Victoria's brother was King Edward VI of England. Both Princess Victoria and Edward VI were children of the great Queen Victoria of England. Mm -hmm. So you have two kings who are grandchildren of Queen Victoria. Yeah, there it is. And have you seen a picture of King George next to uh, Tsar Nicholas II? I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you here in a minute. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's, it's, It's startling. Yeah. So what this means is that also due to his birthright and inheritance, Kaiser Wilhelm II had royal titles in Great Britain as well. In the oh. town of Windsor, very well known for being in the title of the popular Shakespearean play, The Merry Wives of Windsor. Okay, relating to theater, here we go. And everybody remembers <laughs> that one, right? This is one with John Falstaff of the Henry IV plays. And in this one, he tries to seduce two wealthy old widows in some town he's passing through to see which one of them is going to treat him better. And it all falls on his head, right? We all know that. It's actually very (laughs) funny, very much in the vein of a good ancient Roman comedy, like we discussed last time I was on the show. Mm -hmm. And as we, yeah, so. Okay, but back to European royal families and, and close family ties. So as, as Laura was mentioning just a second ago, on top of Wilhelm II and George having branches as a family tree that touch each other, the mothers of King George V of England and Tsar Nicholas of Russia were sisters, making Whoa. those two monarchs also first cousins. Okay, hold on. <laughs> yep, so, it's, it's tangled up. <laughs> I'm just making sure that I'm tracking, that's all. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So the mothers of... George from England and Nicholas from yes. Russia were mm-hmm. sisters. Okay. So they're aunties. Okay. Kaiser and George were first cousins. Let's see. The Kaiser's mother, Princess yeah. Victoria of England. So that's Victoria's daughter. Because she mm-hmm. had to name her daughter after herself. Was married to Kaiser Wilhelm's father from Germany. So you have Wilhelm the, uh, Frederick III, 
and okay. Victoria, Princess Victoria. Okay. Yes. Now, also, Victoria had a bunch of other children. Queen Victoria had a bunch. I think in something I read, there were something like 25 different members of the heads of state of uh, Europe that were somehow out of the oh. children that Victoria had. I thought you had. were going to say she had 25 kids. I was like, holy <laughs> no, uterus. I think, no, I, th <laughs> I think she... <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, somebody's going to correct me on this, but I think she had nine and then, like, 16 grandchildren that all still had royal titles all over the Europe because yeah. Okay. Um, now yeah. Wilhelm. Okay. Wilhelm, take him out of the picture. Then you have yeah. George V of England, Tsar Nicholas. So George's mm -hmm. mother and Nicholas's mm -hmm. mother were sisters. Yes. yes. So that's how that, that connects. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Wilhelm and Nicholas aren't directly related like that. Even yeah. though it is kind of like, you know, we have two or three litters of dogs in the same kennel and they <laughs> yeah. all, well, they're all kind of related, but yeah, that's kind of, but yeah. yeah. So uh, to make this all even crazier, you're going to see King George the fifth and Tsar Nicholas the second together. And I've just sent you that picture. Oh, wow. <laughs> which one's and which, I can, Katie? I cannot. Uh I mean, they're both wearing crosses. Well, one, okay, one's listen. British and one's ah, British and one's oh. Russian. That's it. Oh, Russian. Excuse me. I'm pretty sure Nicholas the guy on the is left on the is left. Russian. He has an mm -hmm. evil vagina on his head. Look, there it is. The evil vagina. <laughs> oh, he sure does. So anyway, Hold okay, you. there we go. There we go. We had to take a break there to just Ooh. see just how intertangled these royal you heads look at of state how related all three are. of them are. If you oh, look yeah. at them like all mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. dude, they all look the same, bro. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's Sorry. Victoria yep. for you. Uh, so anyway, getting back to regular programming. Amidst all this anti-German furor in Russia due to the war, as well as the fact that the Russian citizens had overthrown the royal family partly due to anti-German sentiments, when Kaiser Wilhelm received a message from some current events in Britain on a morning in July 1917, his reaction of outright rage should have been expected. A messenger brought him a memo that was basically just the headline from a British newspaper. And here it is. By the king, a proclamation declaring that the name of Windsor is to be borne by his royal house and relinquishing the use of all German titles and dignities. That's okay. why they're the House of Windsor. Wow. Mm hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> king George the fifth of England was doing much the same that had been done in Russia to separate themselves from their enemies in a time of war. So they changed um, their house name. They changed their house name. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's I was where just, the house I was like, hold on, let me make sure I understand yeah. this. So that's basically what happened. They just decided, okay, from here on out, we're called the house of Windsor, but really the reason was, or one of the reasons was we're in war with Germany, but right. check this out. So what was it previously? Uh, it was, Oh, I'm getting there. <laughs> oh, I can't okay. remember right. what the what the settled Brit in. the British name of it was, but check this out. Another snarled branch in this whole family tree is King George's wife, Queen Mary, born and raised in England, but was born Mary of Tech, the daughter of a German duke. Oh. So the German the, the English queen was German. So George was yep. trying to show his people that they had no sympathy with the Germans. And by giving his wife the name of Windsor, he also effectively removed the Kaiser's Royal heritage in Britain and yeah. effectively deleted from anything British, the Kaiser's family name. I'm going to say it a few times here. Yeah. Saxa Koba Gatha. It's three titles and they're hyphenated. So Saxa, uh -huh. S A X E hyphen Coburg, C O B U R G hyphen Gotha G O T H A Saxa Coba Gotha. I've heard that You're, name actually. Now mm -hmm. that you say it yeah. out loud, you're no longer to be known as Saxa Coba Gotha. Now you are Windsor, and anybody who so, has royal titles with Saxa Coba Gotha no longer has them. He's brushing off those mm. epaulets. So <laughs> yes. he quite he quite legit just stripped him of his titles. Is essentially Completely. what happened. Like 
completely. Yeah. You have this well, royal heritage from your grandmother. Now you don't because we're at war. Mm-hmm. No. Wow. Been exiled, bro. Mm-hmm. And uh, Katie, as you were brushing off your epaulets, I think, or Laurel, I think uh, we can all agree that uh, sounds very much more British than the other name. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, just a little yeah. bit. <laughs> so in any case, once this news got to the Kaiser, I mean, he had to hear it through a oh, newspaper the, headline. Oh, <laughs> the ultimate butt hurt. Now, here we mm-hmm. go. He's going to be He's so sad. Going, oh, mm-hmm. but Russia doesn't like me. My cousin over there has died, and I'm not happy about it. And what is this? My other cousin? Oh, no. <laughs> he was infuriated and stewed on the information. And so he summoned his wife to share the news. Yeah. Now, one... One last element to this story that's fairly enjoyable is that the Kaiser wasn't especially known for his sense of humor. <laughs> mm. uh, no, I would imagine so. When he did crack a joke, it was often particularly lewd or derogatory. So his upcoming response to his wife was somewhat unexpected. So when the Kaiser's wife, Empress Augusta Victoria, who I'm sure is related to several people in this story, heard this news. <laughs> She asked her husband what he was going to do. He replied, there was only one thing to do. He said, and I quote, I propose to take the entire family to the theater to see the Merry Wives of Saxa Cobra Gotha. (laughs) What? Oh, he's so funny. (laughs) Not the Merry Merry Wives of Windsor. (laughs) Oh, okay, I was like sitting here, I was like, wait. What? Just replacing the name of Windsor from one of the most popular titles in the Shakespearean canon with his own family name. If that's what they're going to do, I'm going to go see my play. He said, he said it as an ironic musing and then stomped out of the room. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. And, uh... The creation of the um, House of Windsor in 1917 was just one more lasting legacy of the Great War and the emotions it provoked. Yeah. That's pretty oh. much my story. <laughs> wow. You know what? That's amazing, though, because I, I, when I would look, not that I sit and study, like, you know, royal birth charts of, of Britain, but um, when you see, like, the family tree and the lines that go out, uh-huh. there's a certain oh. point where it just turns Windsor, and it's just done, and that's with, you know. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, Queen Elizabeth yeah. and her family and, and those before it. And I was like, oh, I wonder about that. But I didn't actually look at in terms of time frame and then think, hey, it's probably anti german oh, sentiment. You know, like if there's war. Yeah. Then put two and two together. Yeah. And that's fascinating. Thank you. Well, I mean, you know, you compare it to other wars that we study, like especially in the States, we study. Like, I had a class in history that was a history class called War and Peace, which highlighted the entire history of the U.S., benchmarking frankly the wars because on average we've had one every 20 years it's I like say, this is there ever we... any peace to study because i don't yeah, feel like exactly yeah but it was fascinating because i remember like world war ii was like we had this faction we had this faction and we kind of knew what was going on like these people were faction, doing like that it's stuff, a wrestling match <laughs> yeah exactly but when you talk about World War One, it was like, well, there was a lot of tension and one guy got killed and everybody just went, this is it. This is our time to, to you know, throw in the towel and 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 or rather throw our hat in the ring and, and see what we can make of this. Yeah. And, you know, when it finally ended, I think people were just like, uh, yeah, I guess we're done. Uh <laughs> Yeah, you guys go your way and I'll go my way. And I remember, oh, I remember at the end of my my World War I lesson in that class, they said, and the German soldiers marched home. And there was one young soldier, particularly despondent, that the outcome he was looking for really didn't get there. And he talked about it on the way home, the long march home. And that young man's name was Adolf Oh, God. Mm -hmm. This fucker. (laughs) There he is. Yeah, he was such a grump about the war. I mean, he was a grump about everything. He was, he was worse than a grump. But, but about World War One, there's always a lightly, but 
there are these stories in world war one where he's just like just not having it and you're just like you no. know, like we did the story um at, in Chris, around christmas time of the the brief truce that happened at different parts of the western front and mm-hmm. um and i said then there was one sergeant who was like i don't like that there's camaraderie and talking back and forth mm-hmm. between the opposite sides and i don't like that people are all christmassy and this is this is baloney and his name was adolf hitler so these are these are these little He's stories so where he was like yeah, good at giving his about, opinion right? yeah and, his and opinion can you sucks. just i i think it i can't remember where i heard it it was somebody i really really admire like steve martin or, or it could have been woody allen i don't really admire him anymore but i mean can you imagine what would happen to this world if Hitler was not rejected for art school. The arts are important people. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Save the arts. Some very interesting art coming out of Germany at that time. It would have been. Mm-hmm. They'd be like, actually, that would be. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's my story. The Merry Wives of saxa Gotha. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. You know what? I feel Thank like so part of the everybody being interrelated like that. I feel like that led to just a little bit, not just a, like, you know, everybody's hurt feelings because it's kind of related, but also everybody thinking that they had dibs at everything. Oh, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. when you get into a bigger family like that and there's like one mm-hmm. person at the head that everybody respects and you go, but she always liked me for this. And you mm-hmm. have this person who's like, yeah, but I always felt like you always got a little bit more preference than I did. And then that person's going, yeah, but look what you got. And then they start button heads. And you're like, wait, why are we butting yeah, heads? Yeah, I feel like that yeah. added to it, too, because everybody wanted, again, you're so interrelated at that point. I feel like that Ooh. would create a lot of competition to be like, well, I'm just as good as my cousin. So why can't I rule? austria and germany or whatever you know mm-hmm. yeah. Or, yeah yeah i just feel like that definitely added to a lot of uh that issue <laughs> i would say so yeah i would say so yeah yeah well anyway yeah. there's my story <laughs> thank you Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> anytime It was just patently silly, wasn't it? (laughs) Nothing more than an off-the-cuff remark at theater's expense, but there was a whole load of interesting history behind it, wasn't there? And I don't know, if I were head of state, I'd probably be a little miffed if not everything I did was universally accepted. I don't know. No one has ever been stupid enough to appoint me the head of any state. (laughs) <laughs> but I want to thank Laurel Rockle and Katie Wall for allowing me to replay this footage for you on my show. And I'll encourage you again to go listen to their podcast, High Tales of History. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. And if you do, I doubt you'll be disappointed. OK, I'll go ahead and sign off so I can get ready for everything I have coming up, including episode 100. This has been another episode of Euripides Humanities. This has been Aaron Odom. Another episode will be in your ears in two weeks and I will see you at intermission. Mm-hmm.